Are you capable of writing a working exploit for a buffer overflow vulnerability? Here's a vulnerable setuid root program. Assuming that modern protections are disabled, can you produce a bad file that, when fed to this program, will give you a root shell? If you fire up your virtual box and are able to construct a working exploit from scratch on your own, you're welcome to skip the rest of today's lecture. Otherwise, welcome to Frank Steyan Explains. I'm a professor of security and privacy at the University of Cambridge, and this is a lecture in my security course for second year computer science undergraduates. Today's topic is buffer overflow. You will understand in depth how a buffer overflow attack works by recreating one yourself. This will also give you insights into what can be done to defend against this common vulnerability. I keep repeating this in lecture after lecture, but stay legal. This is adult stuff, it's not a game. These techniques have been used in attacks that have disabled millions of machines. The Morris worm that brought down the internet in 1988 exploited a buffer overflow. The Stuxnet cyber weapon that destroyed a thousand uranium enrichment centrifuges in Iran in 2009 exploited a buffer overflow. You can cause real damage with the attacks I teach you in this course. And if you did cause any damage to others, it would be pretty bad. I want you to become as competent and as ingenious as the smartest of the bad guys at discovering and exploiting vulnerabilities, so that you can stay ahead of them and defeat them. But please don't become a bad guy yourself, otherwise you will lose my respect and you might lose a lot more, including possibly your freedom. The buffer overflow is one of the oldest and most frequently exploited vulnerabilities ever, going back to the 1970s. And despite everything we know about it, there has been no shortage of successful buffer overflow attacks every year for the past several decades. C programmers keep making the same mistakes, somehow encouraged by the language itself. In C, a common and seemingly trivial task, such as for example concatenating several strings to form a new one, is rather cumbersome and error-prone, unless you are very careful. And apparently not every programmer is very careful all of the time. What is buffer overflow? That part is easy to understand. There's a buffer in memory. You write into that buffer some piece of data that's longer than the buffer. See, let's you do that. Many other languages would crash with an error at that point because they check whether you are overstepping the bounds of your array. But not C, because that's an extra cost for the check. And C doesn't do any of the extra stuff behind your back. You want to check? You have to do it yourself and pay for it. That's the philosophy of C, and historically, many official C library functions like gets and strcopy have copied stuff into buffers without any checks of length. And that's appropriate when you know exactly what you're copying into the buffer and how big it is because it's data you created yourself. But it's not appropriate when you're copying an unknown piece of data supplied from the unknown user of your program, which could be anything and could be arbitrarily long. But of course, programmers say, mm, let me just get this to work and I'll insert a check later. Yeah, right. And we know how that works out. Anyway, if you spill over the edge of your buffer, where do your extra bytes go? What do they overwrite? Well, who knows? It depends what else lives in memory near there. If there's another variable next to the buffer, you might overwrite that variable if it's on the right. But you can't tell from the C source code. If you declare a variable A and then a variable B, then the compiler is not contractually obliged to allocate them next to each other in memory in that order. It could rearrange the order. It could insert gaps between them. There are choices that the compiler is free to make on its own. We could have a look and check experimentally. I have actually recorded myself doing all this stuff for real from first principles, including mistakes, all the way to the actual exploits. And, and this is now a detailed tutorial, but it's too long for a lecture, so I'm going to make it available as an optional video for anyone who might need help if they get stuck while doing the work by themselves. It's not officially part of the lecture course, it's just a bonus, a special gift from me, and if you do your seed lab on your own without trouble, then that's fine, and you don't need to watch me doing it as well. On the other hand, if all this is really alien and difficult for you and you feel you need a bit more hand-holding, then be my guest and make good use of that other more chatty and leisurely video where you get to see exactly what I do. The video you're watching now is the official lecture, so I'm going to keep it a bit tighter. Play this game however you like, provided that by the end of it you are able to exploit a vulnerable program yourself. This is a skill you can only acquire by putting in many hours of practice.
especially in the debugging phase. The first thing I show you is that by writing an overlong value into a variable, you may overwrite another variable. Also, that the order of the variables in the source code is not indicative of the order that they appear in memory. And even that, that order might change depending on the compiler options that we use. Using the default configuration on my computer, the compiler puts the reward variable first, even though it's between the other two in the source code, so that neither of the buffers that come after it can overflow into it. We also notice that the default compilation options include code that notices that we have smashed the stack. In order to carry out the buffer overflow attack, since we are still novices, we'll have to disable all the modern countermeasures. We basically wind back the clock to before these countermeasures were introduced to recreate the experience of the first people who exploited the buffer overflows. Anyway, that, strictly speaking, is already a buffer overflow. You overfill the buffer, spill over the end, and overwrite some other sensitive information that you were not supposed to be able to modify. So far, that's very easy to understand, and we can already see the potential for deviousness. But how can you exploit this vulnerability to execute arbitrary code? So far, yeah, we have done some damage, but we have not been executing any code. To understand how a buffer overflow leads to arbitrary code execution, you need to understand how the stack works. And you did a bit of that in the object-oriented programming course last year. You also need to know a bit of assembly language. And you did some of that in Introduction to Computer Architecture earlier this year, even though for a different processor than x86. So refresh your mind about these previous courses. I should mention something pretty basic that often confuses people. When we draw a diagram of memory, then high memory is up. So if you increment the address, you move up. But if you do a memory dump, for example, from inside a debugger, then the print happens as normal from the top of the bottom of the page. And so the higher addresses are lower down. And this can be confusing. Now, if I put my memory diagram horizontally, then low addresses are on the left and high addresses are on the right, and there's no confusion. But then I don't have a lot of space, so you have to get used to the vertical layout as well and be aware of the fact that there is these uh, two contradictory ways of doing things. Um, and then there's, there's another thing, which is little endian and big endian. Also confuses people. Talking about the stack, uh, pushing the return address from a routine, as you do in machine code, is all very well. But actually, if my uh, machine code routine is a translation of a more complicated function in a higher level language, uh, a function that takes input parameters and uses local variables that only exist while I'm inside the subroutine, then all those things have to go on the stack as well. And they must be taken away from the stack when I return. So what I push on the stack when I enter the function is not just the return address, but the so-called stack frame, which contains all that stuff. And the processor supports that to some extent by offering us a frame pointer register that points at the current stack frame. And that's a reference that's independent of the stack pointer, because when I'm inside the routine, inside the function, I could still push other words on the stack and pull them back, and this would change the stack pointer while I'm inside. But I want to be able to refer to my parameters and to my local variables with offsets to something that's fixed. I don't, I don't want this to move around while I'm inside the routine. So if you want to name the elements of the stack frame with fixed offsets from some base, then you cannot use the stack pointer as the base because the offsets would change as you push more words onto the stack during your subroutine. And that's why the frame pointer is introduced so you can have a base for these offsets that remains stable throughout the lifetime of your function. Now, where exactly you put stuff within the stack frame is a matter of convention. But what is done in x86.32 is the following. First, we push the parameters of the routine one by one in reverse order. In reverse order, so that when we read things in memory, then the first thing we encounter is the first parameter, then the second. And after the parameters, we push the return address, place where we get to, where, where we get back to after the routine is finished. And then we push the previous frame pointer to save it somewhere because we are about to overwrite it so that it now points to the current frame, the one that we are building. We overwrite the frame pointer with a stack pointer. 
which right now points at the bottom of the part of the stack frame we built so far, which is exactly where the a previous frame pointer has been stored. And then the routine makes space for its own local variables below that, so that these reside at a negative offset from the frame pointer. As we said, every element of the stack frame is described as offsets from the frame pointer. At offset zero we have the origin of the current stack frame, and in that word we find the previous frame pointer. One word up from that, at offset plus four bytes, or one word, is the return address. One more 32-bit word up from that, at offset plus 8 bytes, that's the beginning of the parameters, the first parameter, then the second, and so forth. At negative offsets from the frame pointer, we have instead the local variables of the routine. So, for example, if I have a 23-character buffer in function f2, it will be at some negative offset from the frame pointer. And so will the other variable g. We can check, and I do that in the full tutorial. Now, this buffer, if I write enough bytes into it, at some point I will exceed its length, and eventually I'll overwrite the stuff at positive offsets from the frame pointer, namely the old frame pointer, and crucially the return address, and then possibly also the subroutines parameters, although that's a lot less serious than overwriting the return address. Now, the very moment the attacker overwrites the return address, that's a bit of an anticlimax, because nothing really happens. The processor doesn't bat an eyelash, it's just writing into some address in memory. Fine, it does that all the time. Trouble comes, however, when the processor gets to the end of the subroutine, possibly after having executed other instructions, and encounters the return instruction. The behavior of the return instruction, as we said, is to pop the top of the stack into the program counter, or instruction pointer, whatever it's called. Uh, and this causes execution to resume from that address. But now I, the attacker, have written a new address into that word so that I can cause the processor to resume execution from wherever I like, including a place that contains machine code bytes that I have just supplied. I, the attacker, didn't write the program that's being attacked. This is a vulnerable program that someone has wrote and that has a buffer overflow. It accepts user input, and I, the attacker, am supplying this input. I'm supplying an overlong input that overflows the buffer and smashes the stack. And in place of the return address, I put the address of what? Of some of the bytes that I just supplied as part of my overlong input, because bytes are bytes, and the program might have thought I was giving it some text or, or a JPEG or whatever it is that the routine expected, but I have instead given it bytes that form a meaningful machine code program. And if I can point the processor at the right place in my sequence of bytes, then it will execute my code. That's pretty amazing. So basically, the arbitrary code execution happens because three things happen. I supply some input, including my malicious payload, pretending that it's just data, and it gets copied into the buffer. I give enough input that I overflow the buffer which allows me to smash the stack and rewrite the return address. And if I can make the rewritten return address point at the place where my machine code payload now is, then my code gets executed. Of course, under the privileges that the vulnerable program had at the time. The buffer overflow enables stack smashing, which enables execution of arbitrary attacker code, which might enable privilege escalation. Now, to make this work, there are a bunch of problems that the attacker must address, some more serious than others. Obviously, number one, as the attacker, to prepare my malicious input, I must first of all be able to write a binary file, where I specify exactly the byte contained at each position in the file. If you can't do that yet, don't worry, I prepared a leisurely paced tutorial for you a while ago, and you can go and check it out by clicking on the card above, if you haven't already played with it, and it's not difficult. Now, two, I also need to know how to express as machine code my malicious payload. For example, I want to invoke a shell. Now, don't worry about that for now, because what we are concerned with today is the attack vector, not the payload. We want to understand how to exploit a buffer overflow vulnerability to execute arbitrary code, but at this stage, we don't really care what this arbitrary code is and what it does and how it is constructed in machine code. 
If this is something that bugs you and you find you can't go on without an answer to that, then don't despair. There is a seed lab for that as well, called the Shellcode Development Lab. It's not examinable, it's not on, on this year's course syllabus, it's totally optional, but you can go and do that if you want to learn how to write your own payload and also how to pay attention to various extra subtleties, such as uh, avoiding to include zero bytes in the payload because a zero indicates the end of a C string. And so the C library function that might copy your bytes into the buffer, if they treat it as a string, they might stop copying at that point and so on. But anyway, let's not worry about that for now. In this video, I'm giving you a pre-made machine code payload that I prepared earlier, and all you should concentrate on is how you get it to execute. The intellectually relevant problem that you should concentrate on are instead the following. Point three, guessing the absolute address where the buffer will appear in memory on the stack. Point four, figuring out exactly where the return address will appear on the stack. The stuff that I need to override. Either it's absolute memory address or it's distance from the start of the buffer, which of course is equivalent if you know the address of the buffer. Because this tells me at which offset in my input file I should put the value with which I want to overwrite the return address. Five, figuring out the absolute address where my machine code payload will appear in memory on the stack, because that is the value I need to poke in place of the return address. I want the execution to resume from the place where I have placed my executable payload. So these last three things, uh, the, the, three la the three ones that you should pay attention to, are obviously related. And um, conceptually, it's very easy. I just need to overwrite the return address with the address where I put my payload. And the difference between theory and practice is that everybody understands uh, buffer overflow with this hand-wavy description, but not everybody is then capable of you know, running GDB, the debugger, figuring out uh, the assembly language, deriving the correct addresses, and building an exploit that works and gives them a root shell. If you are one of my Cambridge students, I want you, every one of you, to be able to uh, do that, become able to do that. It's not conceptually difficult, but it is fiddly. It requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of work, a lot of attention to detail, and a lot of tolerance for seemingly unrelated things that should work, but don't, at least not the way you expected them to. But it's incredibly satisfactory once you finally get it to work. We must do a few experiments to get a feeling for what's going on. So once you have finished watching this lecture, fire up your seed virtual machine and load the lab setup for the buffer overflow attack lab. If you get stuck, you might wish to watch me carry out the attack in detail in that full tutorial that I mentioned. You might also refer to your wonderful textbook, which has plenty of details on the topic. And indeed, this particular chapter on buffer overflow can be downloaded for free from the book website. So what do we do? To start with, uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit and instrument the target program that I'm attacking to um, make it uh, uh, write out the address of the buffer. So in a real attack, uh, we would not be able to do that, of course, but we have to start somewhere. So I'm making life a little easier for myself. We need the payload. And as I said, I, I'm using one that I made earlier. But if you're not fluent in x86 assembly language, you shouldn't worry about how to build one and take it just uh, as a black box. We need to place this payload somewhere in our input file. And then we need to overwrite the return address with the address of the payload. We need to arrange to override the return address, means we, which means we need to place uh, our overwriting value in a specific place. Where is the place to overwrite? Well, that we can find out uh, with GDB, the debugger. Uh, even if um, the uh, stack frame moves around because uh, it, the, it's not always at the same place. Uh, in, in in different computers and different circumstances when other software is loaded. Uh, the stack frame for that program, uh, for that function in that program, keeps the same shape, the same, same structure even when it moves around. And so the distance between the beginning of the buffer and uh, the return address uh, is the same regardless of where uh, 
um, in memory the buffer has been loaded and I can find out that distance, that offset uh, with the debugger. And basically once you have these ingredients that's all there is to it. If you put those pieces together it works. And, and if you watch me doing it then I got root just by combining those things together. Now, if you can do this that's great and you're already ahead of most people who waffle on about buffer overflow and pretend that they know what they're talking about. But they haven't done that. Uh, however, uh, you're still not at the stage where you can exploit a real buffer overflow. Uh, you've only just exploited a toy version you have constructed for yourself where you've edited the source code to tell you the address of the buffer. Now, obviously, in real life, the program that you want to attack will not print the address of the buffer. Why would it? So, what do you do if you only have some kind of a rough guess? Well, I'm going to show you a trick where the same attack file will work for a range of addresses without changing a single byte in your attack file. Because otherwise you'd have, for every address in the range, you'd have to prepare a different file uh, because that file would have to have uh, a different address written for the place to jump to to get uh, to your payload uh, to be executed. So the technique uh, that we're going to use is called uh, knob sled. And let me show you graphically what this is about. This is my memory over here. And my guess is that, okay, that's the range where I expect to find, uh, where I expect to find uh, the beginning of the buffer. It could be anywhere in here. I'm from, from having looked at the, the, you know, the hello world and so on. That's going to be quite a range. Now my bad file, it may not be able to spam all that range, uh, but my bad file is going to be something like this. And my bad file is going to have this return address here, and then here is going to have an op sled, an op sled, and then at the end of that it's going to have a payload. And basically, any of these are good as entry points into my code. If I hit anywhere in here, then I'm going to be good for executing the payload. What happens when I put this thing uh, in, in memory? So I said that the start of um, of the buffer could happen anywhere between here and here. So this means that this can be positioned here, or can be positioned here, or can be positioned here, or can be positioned here, can be positioned anywhere up to here. Because this is the range of possible uh, values for the address of the start of the buffer. So when the start of the buffer is here, is going to happen here. And so all these values, all these addresses, are good entry points for executing my payload. Now, when this is here, then all these addresses are good for executing my payload. OK. But the question that we still haven't answered is, is what should I write in this place? Because I have to write one number, right? I cannot write a, a variable uh, address in here. I have to write a number. It, this is compiled into um, a sequence of bytes that I then have to send. So look at this. This is the crucial point. If I'm here, then any of these addresses here work. As I move this, what happens? Is there an address that works for uh, triggering my payload in all of these cases? I want an address that always works whether the beginning of my, my knob sled is at the bottom of the red squiggle or 
anywhere in the right squiggle or the top of the right squiggle. Now, obviously, I can't have any more range than the length of my knob sled, that's obvious, but I want something that will work in all these cases, and that something is, wait a moment's thought, this, uh, which is the address of the payload itself when uh, when my um, my buffer is in the lowest position because in here it just runs the payload itself without doing any knobs and in the extreme position up here it runs through uh, the whole knob sled and then it runs my payload and anything that's intermediate then if I hit uh, this address then it runs a bit of the knob sled and then my payload. So that is the optimal, optimal thing that I can do. If I assume that my, uh, my bad file is positioned in the lowest place where it could be, then the address I should put in here is the address where my payload is. And then if it really is in that position, then um, no part of the knob sled will be executed. And the further up it is, uh, more of the knob sled will be run if I hit that point before going to the payload. And my extreme of that range is over here where uh, I run through the whole knob sled before doing the payload. So, so what address should you write instead of the return address? This is the crucial point and something that many people understand only superficially, even among those relatively few who can actually do the attacks. The script kiddies get away with just aiming somewhere in the middle of the knob sled, but I want you to understand exactly what is happening and what the boundaries of what you can do are. You must use an address that will lead to execution of the payload, whether the buffer ended up at the bottom or at the top of your allowed range of addresses. Okay, your, your file covers a range of possible addresses and each of these uh, addresses where um, where the buffer could be loaded must result in execution of your payload. Now when the buffer is at the lowest address in your range then your fixed address will point just past the end of the sled directly at the payload. When the buffer is at the top of its range your fixed address will point at the beginning of the sled and otherwise in intermediate cases it will point somewhere inside the sled. Now, uh, you could imagine making a sled that's super long, so it covers all possible cases, even if your guess was not very good. In practice, you can't always make your input arbitrarily long. In, in the case of the challenge program that uh, we've been using, uh, it only reads up to 600 characters from your input file, for example. So, if your guess was wrong uh, and you didn't catch um, the the real address where the buffer was loaded within the ones of the range that you that you program for, then you'll have to try again from another starting point and then uh, move around your range so that you cover uh, all the places where the buffer could have been. But still, that's many fewer tries than without uh, the technique of the knob sled, where you would have had to try every address individually. Now, how big a sled can we fit into 600 bytes? It depends, uh, of course, on how much space is taken up by your payload, uh, but also by the, um, the offset of the return address, because it, it kind of breaks things up. Now, what do you do if you don't know the memory location of the buffer, but also you don't know the size of the buffer, much less the offset uh, to the slot where the return address should be, because you don't have the source code? It's one thing to attack an open source program that you know everything about and it's just that, you know, that instance is owned by root and you don't have root and you want to exploit it to do privilege escalation. And it's a, a rather different thing if you're attacking something that's a, a, a closed source program across the network. You have no way to inspect it. You can't write under the debugger and all you have is just your educated guesses. So it, it's doubly complicated. You have to put your payload in the buffer somewhere, but you don't know the absolute address where it will end up, and so you will not know the address 
of uh, your payload in memory that you need to, to poke. You have to use the address of your payload, or at least of somewhere in the knob sled, to overwrite the return address. Uh, you don't know either what to write or where to write, because you, you also don't know where the return address resides. So, as you build your input, at what relative position in your input are you going to put your payload, uh, and at what relative position are you going to write the address that's going to overwrite, overwrite the return address, and what absolute address do you use uh, for overwriting as something that would eventually be the entry point to your routine. So the knob sled technique that we talked about helps you with the uncertainty on where the buffer is located in memory. But for the uncertainty on uh, the shape of the stack frame and on how far the return address is going to be from the start of the buffer, you can use another technique, which is called stack spraying, which basically means you overwrite not just one location where you know that the return address is going to be, but a range of adjacent locations where you suspect the return address might be. You overwrite all of them with the same value, and hopefully one of them was the right one to overwrite. I hope that by now you want to fire up your seed lab virtual machine and do all of that yourself. The stuff I've discussed in this video, uh, and that I'm showing you in greater detail in the tutorial, corresponds to tasks 3 and 4 of the seed lab on buffer overflow. This is the stuff that all of you must do. The other tasks in the lab, after 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on, uh, are also pretty interesting, particularly the one about the 64-bit version instead of the 32-bit that we've been doing. But I'm leaving them as optional, and only the best hackers among you will get to the end of them. Those of you who do are the ones who will be winning prizes in international capture the flag competitions, I'm sure. Okay, and now with, with this understanding of the technical innards of buffer overflow, let's talk a bit about countermeasures, several of which we have had to disable in order to get going. One of the most obvious things to mention is that uh, languages other than C and uh, an assembler uh, will do bounds checking on your arrays. And so every time you write something in the array, they will check whether uh, it was um, it was overflowing or not. Of course, this incurs a performance cost, but it's actually well worth it for everything except the most performance critical inner loops. So uh, that's your first line of, of defense program in language where it's impossible to create a buffer overflow. Another protection technique is called the stack canary, and you've seen that if you've followed uh, my uh, full length tutorial video, uh, the minus F no stack protector compiler option. This uh, leaves some kind of a marker between the local variables and the return address. This technique consists of leaving some secret marker between the local variables at negative offsets and the return address at positive offset, so that when you uh, overwrite the return address, you have also overwritten this marker. And before the function returns, uh, you would check if the marker is still there. And of course, this uh, incurs a small space and time penalty uh, for every function call. Now, if you put a constant as your marker, then this is relatively easy to bypass. So uh, you should use a variable quantity. And if you use a variable quantity, then it's a lot harder to, to bypass. But uh, actually, uh, everything that is used for doing that is there in memory. So it's not an impossible task for the attacker to uh, fake uh, not having overwritten the marker. Another countermeasure that's been suggested is that uh, the system might maintain a shadow stack, like a second copy, uh, uh, a second stack, and only execute a return if the two stacks were consistent. Because, of course, the buffer overflow could only smash the stack that is in use, not the shadow stack that uh, replicates all the operations that happen. So that clearly has some performance costs and is more complicated. It's an idea that has some merit, but hasn't quite gone mainstream, and it's not the most widespread of countermeasures. Another countermeasure is ASLR, Address Space Layout uh, Randomization. And this consists, as the name suggests, of randomly allocating the starting positions of the code segment, the stack segment, the heap segment, uh, and the libraries. That clearly makes life harder for the attacker who has to guess the position of the buffer that is being 
overflow. However, it turns out there aren't that many bits of entropy available for this operation, and so uh, brute force is in fact feasible, trying to break the scheme by trying all possibilities before the addresses are re-randomized. Uh, we have a kind of arms race of attack and defense with respect to this particular countermeasure, and uh, for example, another thing that's been suggested is that um, the operating system might uh, enforce a delay after uh, a certain uh, executable has crashed a number of times before it can run again, and so this would uh, make brute force uh, no longer feasible. However, the next zigzag in this uh, attack and defense chain uh, is that it turns out that uh, these protected addresses might leak through side channel attacks, which would of course defeat the scheme. As a glimpse into the future, a radical new approach to eliminate buffer overflows and other memory safety violations is CHERRY, Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Instructions, an ongoing research project originated here at Cambridge by my security group colleague Robert Watson and led by him with Simon Moore and Peter Sewell, also from Cambridge, and Peter Neumann at SRI International. Professor Simon Moore, who is a co-PI of this project, uh, has shown you some slides about it in the computer architecture course. Cherry rethinks software security from the ground up, from the processor hardware to the compiler tool chain to the system software. The core idea here is capabilities implemented as pointers augmented with validity bounds and other security metadata. The security metadata is unconditionally checked by the hardware at every axis with negligible runtime overheads. This approach allows the system to run a Unix-like OS called Cherry BST and to offer memory safety to C and C++ programs, mitigating a large fraction of the major vulnerabilities that have affected other current systems. The purposeful co-design of hardware, software and semantics allows formal modeling of the architecture and the development of more extensive security proofs than would be possible in mainstream systems. The project has attracted many collaborators and well over $100 million of government and industry funding. It's not in the shops yet, but it's making its way up through the technology readiness levels. ARM has built a hardware prototype, the Morella board, where the Cherry architecture is built into an ARM processor. This board, which first shipped in January 2022, is currently being distributed to academic and industrial partners for experimentation. I'll stop here, otherwise this will start to sound like an advertisement rather than a lecture course, but check out the Cherry web pages and research papers. This stuff is going to be big. And another countermeasure we encountered and had to disable to carry out our attack is to make the stack not executable. It's a recurring theme in this course that many security attacks ultimately consist of disguising malicious code as data. And therefore, it's very good when we can categorically say this is data, don't ever treat it as code. There's even processor support for marking the stack segment as not executable. So this sound sounds like it's a, it's a great final solution. But actually, if attackers smash the stack and rewrite the return address, they are basically writing the second part of some kind of jump instruction, actually the return instruction, and the first part, the fact that there is a jump, is something that nobody can take away. So you can't actually prevent the attackers from jumping somewhere else, even by disabling uh, execution of code on the stack. And sufficiently devious attackers will jump somewhere else where there's already code that does what they want. To find out how that's done, watch the next video in this series about the return to libc attack. With buffer overflow, we are really doing the moral equivalent of studying the classics of our discipline. To my students at Cambridge, I want each of you to be able to compute the addresses and offsets that lead to a working attack on a vulnerable, uh, vulnerable program. Bring up your CVM, complete the, at least the tasks 3 and 4. You get no marks for doing any of this, so don't search for solutions online because you're not cheating me, you're only cheating yourself out of an education. You will never learn anything as well as when you finally get it going on your own after hours, after all-nighters of banging your head against the wall. My detailed tutorial video may be useful if you get stuck. Otherwise, consult with the supervisors, but don't expect that they will be debugging your failed attempts.
Post questions and comments down below as appropriate, and also feel free to respond to others if you think you can help them. If you write a comment, any comment, mention potatoes, so that I know you were here till the end. Many thanks for watching, happy hacking, and I'll see you in the next video.